In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we're gonna talk about using a tarp with your canoe, earning an income from your bushcraft content, protecting your sleeping bag from sweat, dealing with frowns, strides for walking, and veganism and vegetarianism in the context of bushcraft. Welcome, welcome to episode 51 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions about wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life. And one thing to mention for those of you who are coming to the bushcraft show in Derbyshire at the end of May, 27th to 29th of May, I've got a main stage presentation, but I've also got scheduled a live episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, and we will do our best to record that. The plan is to record it, but I will be answering questions live on stage at the bushcraft show, and that is on the weekend of 27th to 29th of May. May 2017. I will be there with the Frontier Bushcraft team. We'll have a stall there. I'm doing a main stage presentation on accelerating your bushcraft learning as well as the live Ask Paul Kirtley. They're two separate events on the main stage and Ray Goodwin is doing a talk on the main stage as well as running some canoeing sessions there as well. So lots to have a look at there in terms of what myself and Frontier Bushcraft and associated people including Ray Goodwin are doing and you can check on the Frontier Bushcraft website. I've put a post there which explains all the things that we're doing, who's going to be there, what times, etc, etc, with relevant links to more information if you need them. I will put a link to that in the show notes, both on YouTube and on my blog. But those of you who are fans of Ask Paul Kirtley in particular, check out the opportunity to come and ask live questions and have live answers uh, at the Bushcraft show at the end of May. And for those of you that can't make it, um, the plan is to record that as well in the usual manner and we will have that online for you. But it won't be the same as being there. So if you can be there, please come and please support me. It's going to be embarrassing if there's like two people there and tumbleweed going through. So the more the merrier there. Um, it'd be great to see you all. Great to see many of you who have been watching and listening to this show for the past couple of years. And it is a couple of years now that I've been doing this. All right, let's get into the questions. Let's get into the questions. First one is about using a tarp with your canoe. And this is from Bernard. And Bernard asks, um, he's planning a three day river canoe trip in the UK. He'd like to use a tarp combined with the canoe for sleeping. How do I support the canoe on its side so I can use the tarp over it? Thanks. Well, there is, there is this, um, romantic idea of using the, the tarp with a canoe, and it can be super useful as well. I've used canoes in particular as wind breaks, and just in terms of stopping the wind coming howling through your camp, either where you're sleeping or where, you're, where your fire is, we've used that, and we've used it in the UK, and we've used it in Canada as well, and it works extremely well. And you don't really necessarily need to get it right on its side. You wanna turn the boat over and then get it resting where it will rest naturally. And actually, if you look at the uh, photos, or at least the, the reproductions of sketches and paintings of voyageurs for example that's exactly what they did they turned the boats over and they were able to sleep partially or completely under those great big 36 foot birch bark canoes now of course um, it's hard to get yourself right under a, a smaller canoe but you can still do it a uh, a 15 or 16 foot canoe is plenty long enough for a person to lie down under and it doesn't need to be right on its side precariously resting on one of the gunnels you can roll it over until it's happy resting where it where it rests but clearly that doesn't leave you a lot of room so what you might want to do is just have that at the back as a backstop and then do something else with the tarp over the top of it so you've got a windbreak behind you perhaps and then the tarp coming up over and then you could create a lean-to if you really really do want to put it on its side 
side, then you're going to have to lean it up against a couple of trees or get a couple of stakes in the ground and lean it up that way. The other way that we've used canoes sometimes is in areas where there aren't so many trees and we've actually used the canoes as tie-off points for tarps. Even, um, even in relatively barren areas you can have some quite um, innovative tarp setups if you're willing to use the canoes. If there's several of you, you can tie off guy lines etc across to, tar uh, to the canoes and particularly if you put some weight in them um, because obviously a, a, an empty canoe is relatively easy to move if you're going to pull it laterally so having a bit of weight in there can help as well to use them as tie-off points. So um, back to your original question, if you're on your own I would say get it, get it rested over on itself and then create maybe some sort of lean-to um, structure or have something with a ridge line going across with one side coming down to the canoe so it gives you more shelter on one side. That's what I'd be looking to do rather than trying to create some sort of um, construction where I have to have the canoe on its side because of course if you've got the canoe right on its side it might be touching where the gunnel's hitting the ground but then it's going to curve up and away from that and you might get drafts coming around. It may well be better to turn it on to its side so there's more of the gunnel touching the ground and you get more windproofing down at ground level. So experiment with that and then attach your tarp to it or bring your tarp over the top of it and that should serve you well. I've just done a, a, a nearly week-long trip in Scotland and I have to say while I did use tarps for most of that trip um, I didn't attach it to my canoe at all. Um, some of the places we camped weren't necessarily where we left the canoes for example we camped a little bit higher up and getting the canoes up to those spots might have been a bit tricky. Um, tied the canoes off a bit lower down um, and then went on to higher ground, drier ground, flatter ground where we could get set up. Um, and if you are interested, I will be making a little film out of that trip on the River Tay, as well as I would imagine writing at least one article about it. So keep an eye on my blog for more information on that trip that uh, myself and Spoons did recently in Scotland and that might give you some ideas about camping spots and uh, organisation on those trips as well to the extent that we've got some footage and some photos of those things in that content. But good question and it's good to use what you've got with you, that's the important thing and the canoe is very useful for many things around camp. Um, okay, here is a video question from Micah George also known as Northeast Wilderness. And it's a video question, um, which I will play now. Hey Paul, Micah George here in Western Massachusetts in the US. First time caller, long time listener. Um, I've been practicing bushcraft for about three years since I learned the term, that is. And uh, in the course of those three years, I've been documenting my, my journey and my, my learning process on Instagram. And I've amassed a pretty good following and um, in the last year I've started to get sponsors and um, it's just been wonderful and uh, making more videos on YouTube uh, that people have been responding to really well. And so my question for you isn't as a, a woodsman or as an educator, but as a bushcraft personality. Um, how do I go about making an income from my content? What are pitfalls to avoid and mistakes, things to, to do? And um, you know, how do I avoid being seen as a sellout? So I guess my question to you is, how do I get paid at Bushcraft without compromise? Thanks, Paul. Okay, good question there from Micah, or series of questions really, um, via Instagram. Nice use of Instagram there, Micah, very good. Um, so, questions, questions. How do you make an income from your content? Well, it's the same old story really um, that it's always been it's just that we live in a world now where you or I can be our own TV channel or we can have a a, a program on a channel however you want to think of it if you want to think of Instagram as a channel as YouTube as a channel we can have our own shows on those channels and then the job of course is to get some people to tune in and follow what we're doing and be interested and for us to be consistent with what we're putting out and that's one piece of advice I would give you. It's not something I'm always particularly good at because I have different pools on my time. Um, um, and my main income isn't from online content. So I would caveat, I would caveat that from 
you know, from the start of this conversation that yes, I do earn a little bit of advertising revenue just from the general ads on YouTube, for example, because I, I just allow pre-roll ads and uh, the, the sidebar ads and stuff on my vids, but it doesn't make me a huge amount of money and it's not the reason why I do it. It's just that everybody else does it. So, um, you know, it earns me a little bit of pocket money and helps buy you know batteries and bits and pieces for recording videos and those sorts of things and that's about as much as i as i get from doing that um i don't have as big a youtube following as some people um, um i've got about twenty-five thousand subscribers which is quite small in in the context of youtube generally and um, so i'm speaking from that perspective as well um, but it's big enough to get some sponsorship deals certainly uh, and you're you're certainly getting some sponsorships already and so i'm rambling a little bit there but i just want to give you the um the context from which i'm speaking but um the advice that i would give you first off is it's the same old story it's the same as tv how would you make money out of having a tv channel well you either ask people to put ads on your show and youtube will do that for you and shares the revenue with you so that is one way clearly and i don't know if you're doing that i suspect you are most people do do that and you can get some ads the other way of course then is actually doing some product placement so forming a, a closer relationship with some brands manufacturers and um, having some sort of content around that. And it could just be that you're using it and you're being seen to be using it. So a sort of sponsorship deal and that could go across multiple channels. So that could go across YouTube, that could go across onto Instagram as well. That's one way of doing it. Or you could um, accept money for doing reviews. Personally, I think there's a conflict of interest there um, simply because if somebody's paying you to um, assess their products, however hard you try to be objective it's our natural instinct is not to want to bite the hand that feeds us so personally i don't take money for reviews i will accept equipment for reviews um, and i'm happy to send that back afterwards or if people want me to keep it or are happy to keep it that's fine but i don't i don't do reviews to get free kit as it were um, I'm happy to do whatever people want at the end of it. And I occasionally do accept equipment that I'm interested in. I won't, I get offered an awful lot of shite, frankly, that I'm not interested in. And I'll just say, sorry, no, that's not a good fit. I'm not interested in that. Similarly, I'm also offered a lot of opportunities for people to advertise on my blog. And those of you that look at my blog will notice there's virtually no advertising on there. The only way that I earn any money out of my blog is either by directing people towards things like my courses, which clearly I do charge for, or directing people towards um, books that I recommend on Amazon. And um, again, I'm not going to, I don't just put loads and loads and loads of links onto as many things as possible. I only link to stuff that's recommended. And with Amazon Associates, you get about four or five or 6%, depending on the volume you're doing, of the purchase price of anything that's bought via somebody clicking on a link. So that's another way that you could do, you can do sponsored links on, on YouTube. So you can promote other people's stuff, either kind of passively through advertising and being on platforms that allow you to monetize your content with advertising, or you can form closer relationships where you're promoting equipment one way or the other, um, either by using it or by reviewing it, or by saying, I'm, you know, I'm featuring this kit, um, however you want to do it. And that's kind of up to you to form that relationship. The one thing I would say about those relationships is um, influencer marketing, as it's known, where brands put products in your hands to be featuring on Instagram, on YouTube, etc is considered amongst the marketing industry is considered to be a cheap form of advertising and brand building and that to me then means that we are not charging enough for that stuff so i think a lot of people will just accept the equipment um, for use and just you know somebody will send you a free backpack or a free knife or a free pair of boots or a rucksack or a sleeping bag or whatever it is and you're happy to receive the kit and then uh, just be seen to be using it because you're like hey i'm getting free kit this is awesome but the thing is that's really really cheap 
for the brand compared to advertising in magazines, compared to advertising on television, compared to advertising on radio, it's cheap as chips. And I think we, as people who have some influence over people, need to have a serious think about what we're actually charging brands for that because we, you know, it's blood, sweat and tears to build an audience, as you know. Um, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of thinking about what videos you're going to make, a lot of thinking for me about what articles I'm going to write, what podcasts I'm going to make, um, spending time making these videos, and then the post-production. I don't have a team that does everything after, it's me that has to take the footage home, put it on my computer, assemble it into an episode, do the screenshots, create the uh, thumbnails, upload them to YouTube. We have to do all of that stuff. There's a lot of time and effort involved and we have to have a serious think about what we actually charge people for being on our platform that we've worked our asses off to build and to build the trust of our audience. And then that word trust is an important one that I'm coming on to with, with, the, with your question you ask about how do you not be accused of being a sellout? Well, you've built the trust of your audience, you've built the interest of your audience. What you have to do is still be honest uh, with your audience and you have to be true to yourself. So if you suddenly, um, you know, addressed head to toe in a particular brand, kind of going, hey, this stuff is awesome, then maybe you've, you have sold out a little bit. You have to be very, very um, honest about the relationship that you have with the brand if you're doing product placement, um, sponsorship, that type of thing, because otherwise people think you're being underhand about it. It's a natural, uh, I think, tendency to be a little bit suspicious. Like, for example, I, I ran an axe course recently and I posted on the first day of the axe course, I bring out this big box of axes. Um, and everything from small hatchets up to big felling axes. We've got big splitting axes. We've got specialist carpentry axes, carving axes. We've got splitting wedges, um, a number of different saws as well we brought out. So all of these tools that we're going to discuss and, and to create a bit of an overview of some of the things that we're going to do during the week. I got all those axes out on the first day and it was a lovely sunny day and there was this nice tree stump and I laid all the axes out um, for, the, for the talk on the course and I did my presentation which was an hour or so on all these different types of axes and how they're constructed and the bevel shapes and all that sort of stuff and at the end the sun was shining and I took a photograph and posted it on, on Instagram which cross posted it onto Facebook and then I, I, I don't look at Facebook when I'm away um, but when I got home I had a look at Facebook and um, somebody commented oh yeah and sponsored by you know question mark suggesting that I'm posting that photo because I'm sponsored by the, the axe, man, axe manufacturers. Most of the axes there were Grants Falls Brooks but not all of them some of them were other manufacturers as well um, and that's one of the things, the benefits of coming to do that course, you get to try lots of different axes from different manufacturers. So the, 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 I don't just have Grands Falls axes, I do have a good range of Grands Falls but I have some others as well. And we talk about the pros and cons of different ones, and people get the chance to have a look and try before they maybe decide to get some for themselves, one or two axes for themselves for example. Um, but yeah, the, the assumption immediately is that I'm being sponsored by them. No, I bought all of those axes myself and most of them not even at trade price actually, most of them at retail price. So um, there, is a, there is a cynicism coming in already about why we're posting this stuff and I think you have to stay away from fueling that by being completely honest with your um, audience and, and clearly there are other people watching this who are maybe in your audience and my audience and people can leave comments about their feelings about people having um, product placement, kit promotions etc on their channels. Personally um, I have virtually no kit that's supplied to me by any manufacturer. Um, I have some accounts with some manufacturers where I can get things at trade price because I use them a lot. So for example, I get some Fjallraven trousers and things at trade price and I like wearing that stuff. But I don't wear or use anything that I don't like and I wouldn't form a relationship with a brand if I didn't like their product. Like there are some brands that would like to form a relationship with me but I don't really particularly like their stuff. I've seen it break, I've seen it wear out or it just doesn't fit with what I do in the outdoors and the way that I do it. And so therefore I'm not going to take their stuff just because I'm getting it for free. And I certainly wouldn't take it and let them pay me for it because then you're not being true to your core beliefs. And I think that that is how you avoid being a sellout is that you're, you're honest and you're, and you're honest with yourself, you're honest with people who approach you to form relationships and you, you have an idea of where you want to be. 
um, rather than just being a prostitute to uh, gear manufacturers and equipment manufacturers and anybody else that would like to pay you money to get access to your audience. Because at the end of the day, that's how you'll lose your audience. If, you, if they think that you're just prostituting them out to people for money, they'll, they'll quickly disappear and find somebody that's more genuine and more authentic. So I think that's, that's the way that you avoid being um, genuinely being a sellout in that sense of the word. But equally, whatever you do, as soon as you start trying to earn an income from what you do, particularly when you haven't really earned an income from it before, somebody's gonna call you a sellout. It just happens. People, people don't have, some people just don't have nice things to say about anybody. Some people take it personally. Um, and you just have to wear that. Some, some people are, you know, the more you do and the more successful you are and the more prominent you are and the more of a profile you have, the more people are going to be critical um, or the more you will find that some people are critical. And that's just life. That's just life in general. If you, you know, look at anybody, pop stars, rock stars, politicians, uh, particularly politicians, um, but, uh, you know, film stars, uh, sports people, uh, TV personalities, authors, whoever it is, if they're in the public eye, it's large or small, somebody somewhere doesn't like what they do. Um, that's just the way it is. And particularly if you start charging for what you do indirectly or directly, some people are not going to like that either. Um, people criticize me. They say, oh, you know, you, you charge... Uh, you charge for, for teaching stuff which, uh, you know, these skills are about nature and nobody owns nature and these skills are being passed down for generations. How can you charge for courses? Well, fine, go and do a course where somebody isn't charging. But the, the fact of the matter is we live in a world where um, you need to earn a living. And yes, you can do the occasional YouTube video or the occasional weekend course or whatever it is that you're doing around bushcraft and not really charge very much for it or charge nothing for it as long as you've got an income somewhere else but if you want to be a professional and you want to devote your time and your life to serving others by sharing what you know by continuing to learn more to synthesize to to bring it together with experience working with other experts and bring it to um, other people's attention who maybe don't have the time or the resources to spend that amount of effort and energy on learning those skills, then um, that's my place. That's what I'm trying to do. And some people don't see the value in it, and that's fine. Um, I, some people don't see the value in learning bushcraft at all. But then there's people within uh, bushcraft, the bushcraft world who are interested in bushcraft who don't really see the value in paying for things and that's fine as well but maybe they just aren't your particular audience and equally some of them are going to criticize you and i would say don't take that to to, to heart but just be honest with your audience your core audience and um that is that is the key thing um pitfalls mistakes to avoid i would say um I've already mentioned about not undercharging. Don't ever accept anybody's first offer. <laughs> That's just business. That's got nothing to do with bushcraft. Um, do do some things for free, maybe. Um, That's the flip side of it, but choose them wisely. If it gets you more exposure by partnering with a brand or partnering with another media form that gets you more exposure, maybe do it for free. But otherwise, um, if, you, if you want to earn an income from it, uh, make sure that you're charging the right amount. Most people, when they start in business, and I've made these mistakes in business, um, they undercharge for things because they, they don't feel confident to charge what they really need to charge, or they haven't worked it out properly. You know, I've seen a lot of bushcraft schools, and I know we're moving away from your question, but I've seen a lot of bushcraft schools arrive big fanfare nice website quite inexpensive courses compared to what i charge and what some of the other top schools charge um, who then disappear in a short period of time even though they're undercutting the existing market um, terrifically they're not making enough money with the customers that they're getting 
uh, to sustain themselves. There is a there is a le there's a limit to how little you can charge and be sustainable. And at the end of the day, you're not going to serve an audience very well at all, whether it's in person or over the internet, over YouTube or Instagram, if you're not earning enough money from it because you'll have to go and do something else eventually so charge the right amount work it out and don't be afraid to ask and some people will tell you no we're not we're not paying that and that's fine because they're wasting your time otherwise you can go and find somebody else that will pay you that um, you have to come at it from a perspective of not scarcity but of abundance if you approach it from the uh, from the uh, uh, perspective of abundance that there will be always more there'll be another offer around the corner don't waste your time with the people who are nickel and diming you um, ask for what you want if you don't get it move on to the next move on to the next um, and then the other pitfall I would just say, avoid is don't start getting yourself on a treadmill where you feel like you have to produce content to keep people happy in terms of um, advertising revenue or product placement or whatever whatever it is you want to do um, think carefully about what you can again sustainably sustainably produce don't promise the moon and then really struggle to deliver it in terms of amount of content that features features a brand features a, a logo features a product whatever it is um, if, if that's the way you're going to go um, do be uh, sustainable in both of those ask for the right amount of money but also be uh, conscious of the fact that you can promise too much and then you just give yourself a hamster wheel that you have to keep turning um, give your space give yourself space still to maintain some cre creative creativity because um, otherwise you'll you'll get tired of the treadmill after a while there's always that danger of turning your hobby your interest your passion into a living that it becomes a treadmill and at times i have to say it's felt a little bit like that for me not because of the not because of the outdoors of nature or customers or anything like that it's just the business side of things dealing with accountants taxation tax returns etc 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 insurance you know cash flow management all that stuff is a ball ache sometimes and it just makes you feel like why am I doing this you know I'm spending all my time on this and not so much time doing the stuff that I really want to do so again don't let that get you down you will have times when it just feels a bit a little bit like a treadmill but look at the look at the end result that you're aiming for so right from the start have an idea about what what do you want to happen what do you want it to do what do you want this to do for you do you just want to get free kit do you want it to pay for you to do several trips a year do you want it to be your sole income and you want to learn, earn twenty thousand thirty thousand fifty thousand dollars a year from it what do you actually want to achieve and why what you know most people can get away with earning not very much money as long as they're not buying expensive cars paying a big mortgage whatever it is how much money do you actually need what do you want to happen what do you want to pay for with the money that you're going to earn? Set that as a target and then look at how you can achieve that and keep that in mind without f falling into the pitfalls that I, um, that I talked about in terms of being uh, untrue to yourself, untrue to your customers or your viewers and making sure you charge enough and don't, um, don't, be, don't have your time wasted by people who aren't willing to pay and move on to the next and be willing to accept the fact there will be something another opportunity around the corner um, and I think that will stand you in good stead and I'll be interested to hear any other comments from viewers in the um, in the comments about product placement about logos advertising etc etc on YouTube on Instagram elsewhere do you like it do you hate it um, do you like to see people making money and uh, making a living from making YouTube videos or do you think that they should get a proper job and um, do that on the side just to help other people out? What, what do you think? Let us know in the comments below, whether you're on my blog or on YouTube, let us know and that'll be interesting for me and that'll be interesting for, for Micah as well, I'm sure. And hopefully that's helpful, Micah. Sleeping bag liner to protect a bag from sweat. This is from Jack. 
And here's a question is, um, I've had several sleeping bags, a mix of down and synthetic for all seasons and situations. And I have a question about sleeping bag liners, particularly with a down bag, can a sleeping bag liner be used to prevent a buildup of moisture in the bag? I'm aware that you perspire overnight and if you're required to sleep in clothes, or on a milder night, your bag can get quite damp from sweat if you are not careful. Would a sleeping bag liner help keep your bag dry from sweat? Many thanks and hope all is well, Jack. Um, well, the only, the only thing that's gonna stop any moisture getting into your sleeping bag is like sleeping in a polythene bag where there's a vapor barrier between you and the bag, but you're gonna get wet doing that. Your clothes, if you're wearing clothes, even if they're just thermals, are gonna get damp doing that. Or even if you're just wearing a t-shirt and, and underpants, that's gonna get wet. Um, the question really is just making sure you don't get too hot. As you've uh, alluded to, warm nights, milder conditions, particularly if you're out in the spring and you've taken quite a, a, a taken a four season sleeping bag, for example, and you have a mild night, you might be too warm. That's about managing zips, managing baffles, making sure you're not getting too warm. Um, then of course, on colder nights, you're gonna get some condensation buildup between the outside of a bag, a sleeping bag and a bivy bag. Sometimes um, that's almost inevitable, um, but that's a case of airing the bag out in the, uh, in the morning, if you can or leaving it hanging under a tarp in the breeze if you fear uh, rain or showers, for example. And I've covered those sorts of things elsewhere um, and on my blog and on other Aspel Kirtleys. Um, in terms of a sleeping bag liner, it's not really going to stop you perspiring. In fact, it might actually make you perspire more because sleeping bag liners tend to increase the rating of a sleeping bag. Even my silk liner, which I use sometimes, um, I tend to use it between don't really use it in the summer because it's too warm i don't use it in the depths of winter because i'll probably be wearing thermals um some merino thermals so i tend to wear it when i'm using a four season bag but it's it's a, it's past the time when i'm going to be wearing thermals during the day and i'll just get into the bag and i want to keep particularly the down bag i want to keep it clean um don't want to clean it so often um so I use a silk liner in, the, in that sort of transition period, but it does tend to make the bag warmer than it would be otherwise. So it's not necessarily gonna stop you perspiring and it's not going to sort of hold any moisture or stop it going into the sleeping bag. So my suggestion would be definitely don't use a cotton liner. That's a bad idea. Use a silk liner if you feel it's necessary for keeping the bag clean, keeping yourself warm, but otherwise just manage the zips, manage your clothing, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that you're not perspiring too much and then air the bag out every morning um, preferably when it's still warm from your body warmth because that will help drive the moisture off from the bag those would be my uh, recommendations and if you're still getting a really sopping wet bag from sweating too much you've probably got too high a rated bag frankly and um, it'd be you could move down a rating for the season you're sleeping out in if you're sweating that much Dealing with frowns, this one is from Ant, Ant Bass, and he says, Hi Paul, firstly thanks for your effort you put into these videos and podcasts. Having done a small amount of editing before, I know just how time consuming it is on what is your own free time. Going back to what we are talking about with Micah before, yeah, it is a lot of effort to build these channels and these shows when you don't have the backing of, um, I think we're used to used to stuff being produced, but with the backing of big production companies and TV companies. No, the, one of the great things about YouTube, one of the great things about the internet is you, you've got people producing niche content that serves the needs of a, a relatively small audience, but a very interested audience, and you can serve them in great depth and in great detail. Um, but we're still living in a world where that's mostly done by people doing it on their own, off their own bat. And it's nice to know that people appreciate the effort that goes in, because it is quite a lot of effort. And um, I feel bad sometimes that I'm not being as consistent with these shows as I maybe could be. But um, going back to the previous conversation with Micah, I think, um, at some point, maybe uh, I need to look at other ways of generating an income from these shows so that I can actually do them more often. That's the equation that we're all playing with, you know, time versus effort um, and having to earn a living at some point. Um, so anyway, um, 
Ant says, I am a humble student of bushcraft, always learning but having been involved for over 15 years when it didn't have such a label. Now my children are, are at an age when playing in the woods is a treat, something I wish to keep up. My question is not about kit, craft or techniques, but rather that of behaviour. Living in the north, uh, living in the east of England, Norfolk, I am conscious that there are not a huge amount of places to discreetly teach the outdoor ways to kids. I never light an outdoor fire, but do use a solo stove, for example. I'm conscious of not ruining the perception for the future. Often we come across areas of people who frown upon seeing a tarp and a fire or a stove as if it's abnormal. Some we meet stop to say how great it is that we spend time together, father, son and daughter. I'd like advice on how to deal with those who think I'm irresponsible with teaching them to light a stove. To me, it's an issue of respect. My pleasure comes from being outdoors, so I'm less likely to create issues of harm as I wish to protect it. I would like my children to grow up appreciating this, even if it's not an outdoor pursuit they choose, as I feel it's a ground, good grounding for everyday life. When you receive a frown out on the trail for just being different, how do you diplomatically deal with it? Approach, <coughs> excuse me, approaching midlife and hope that a special midlife present may be the chance to attend one of your courses. Many thanks, and Well, that's an interesting question. Nice to hear that you are uh, spending so much time out with your kids and sharing your knowledge with them and introducing them to nature and introducing them to tarps and fire lighting, albeit in the context maybe of a, of a small wood stove or what have you. Um, that's all great and I would encourage that. And I, I do think it probably is abnormal. You know, in the UK, more than 80% competing with the bird song at the moment. Uh, in the UK, more than 80% of people live in urban or suburban environments. And so country life is less and less normal. Being out and about, just straight out your front door into the countryside is less and less normal. People's knowledge of the countryside is, on average, those, there are those of us, yourself included, and I would imagine most of the viewers of this show, who take a much deeper interest in nature and a much deeper interest in a practical knowledge of nature. But for most people, it's kind of alien and a bit strange. And so it is abnormal. Um, but I think if you, if people, if, if people just frown at you, don't worry about it. You know, people, you walk down the high street in any town dressed slightly differently, somebody's gonna frown at you, people are gonna point, people are gonna mutter, you know, anything that's vaguely different, people tend to comment on or have an opinion about. People have way too many opinions about things that they don't know anything about. And I tend to ignore those opinions, frankly, because they come from a perspective of ignorance. Um, so I tend to let that stuff sort of wash off. Um, but if somebody engages you in conversation or criticism, then I would say exactly what you said to me, that um, you're showing your kids an appreciation of nature um, understanding the damage that can be done with a fire but knowing how to do it carefully within maybe in the context of a small um, box stove or what have you that's showing them respect for nature it's showing them how to do it carefully without causing damage um, because i see a lot of evidence or not not too much thankfully but enough evidence of young people going out into the woods uh, tends to be close to towns close to roads close to places they can easily get to as soon as they have a, a vehicle or a you know a motorbike or a car um, and you can see that a lot of the time the damage that is done in terms of fires that are too large scorching the ground scorching rocks scorching fallen trees scorching the base of living trees leaving litter etc it's it's not because they want to make them they don't go yeah let's go and ruin this place they just don't know any better it's from a perspective of ignorance so if you're teaching your kids a different path to that then that's valuable and i would explain that exactly to anybody who might be vocal in criticizing you i would just say look i'm teaching them how to respect nature how to take care of it how to tidy up after themselves and how to be comfortable in nature and frankly um if they're walking there, walking their dog, walking themselves, they must appreciate nature too. And if they really don't get it, 
then just tell them to shove off and mind their own business frankly that's that's that would be my <laughs> that would be my approach sometimes you just have to be blunt with people um i've had people on private estates where we are paying the estate for use of the land um where we are not on a uh, on a public footpath i've had people walking through our camp telling me that i'm not allowed to be doing that there when they have nothing to do with the estate they're saying we shouldn't be having we shouldn't be camping here we shouldn't have fires we shouldn't be we shouldn't have a vehicle up there or whatever it is and you you try to engage them in civil conversation and say well actually we do have permission and they're like I remember one woman in particular was like, really, I very much doubt it. Blah, blah. And in the end, I had pretty much had to tell her to shove right off and get lost because um, she was the one who was trespassing. Um, but, she, but she was treating, like it, treating it like it was her land because she probably had walked her dog there for a long time. She happened to come through when we were running a course um, and took umbrage. Um, people are weird like that sometimes. Um, they're not very self-aware of their place they, they they go around looking at the world like it's all theirs it's their domain um everything's centered around their views and sometimes you can engage with that and have a conversation otherwise uh, you sometimes just have to shove it away because it's just a problem um in the same way that you kind of swat a fly away that doesn't get that you don't want it in in, in your face sometimes it, you just can't get through unfortunately but generally try to have a civil conversation Try to explain your philosophy um, if it's a conversation. If it's a frown, who cares? You, people, people frown at you wherever. You, if you went into town with your muddy boots on, you'd probably get frowned at. So, you know, don't worry about that. I wouldn't, anyway. Lost the questions. Here we go. Strides for walking. Now I read through this and thought it was a bit unusual and I like to have different questions. Noisy, noisy birds. So this is from George via email and he says, um, thought that you may appreciate a question other than about kit. Certainly George, always do. Um, recently I had a hip replaced and may soon walk again. I'm studying strides and find it all a little confusing. I have heard of the French army bent knee, the hunter stride, the lock step for steep grades and many others. Do you have a preferred method that you employ? Thanks for your time. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff written about how you should walk. Um, there's a lot of stuff, there's even more stuff written about how you should run. And um, I know from speaking to people who know more about physiology than I do that um, everyone walks and runs differently. And that um, it was actually the interview, for example, interview with Mark Hines. And I'll link that in the show notes, um, the podcast that I did with Mark Hines. Um, he made a very good point that he can't tell you how to run, um, even though he studied the biomechanics of running. He can't tell you how you should run. Different people run in different ways and um, you have to find your own way. And it's the same with walking. Yes, there are some general principles. If you're walking up a steep grade or down a steep grade, you generally want to reduce the length of your stride because you're less likely to trip, slip or fall that way. And you can manage, uh, you can manage your effort going uphill. It's a little bit like changing down in a vehicle from, you know, fourth into third into second as you increasingly go up a steep hill and you want to change your step so you can continue momentum you're maybe not going to get quite as far with each step but you can keep moving you're shortening the steps as you're going uphill and equally as you're going downhill you're probably going to shorten the strides because it's going to be easier on your joints rather than striding out but each step having to sort of stop yourself a little bit um, and also particularly on shaly gravelly uh, trails you're less likely to slip over if you're just making shorter steps on particularly steep ground but other than that i would say find your own way um, george one thing that you might want to experiment with is walking poles either just a traditional walking stick um, you know a nice a nice staff to walk with or a thumbstick a typical 
of um, what people always did use as a walking stick, um, or the modern walking poles, the lightweight poles that a lot of people use for trekking, because it does allow you to distribute your weight differently, allows you to distribute your balance differently, and move in a slightly different way over rough terrain. Um, but even with those, find your own way with that. So. I wouldn't say that you should try and force your body to walk in a way that it doesn't want to. Go out, walk naturally, be mindful of your step on steep ground and experiment with some walking poles or a walking stick and I think you'll find the most comfortable way for you um, in, in doing that rather than trying to be dogmatic about a way that you should be walking. Hopefully that's helpful George. Last one for this one. I'm limiting it to six questions these days to try and keep the, the, the time relatively uh, manageable for people in terms of listening and, and watching. Um, this is a question from Sam and apologies it's taken me a while to get around to this question Sam. Um, I, I've answered a lot of sort of more relevant winter questions over the winter, I have to say, but I do, I do try and get through all the questions eventually, um, even if it takes me a while. So this question is from Sam and he says, I recently started a vegan diet and I'm working towards removing all animal products, including leather and wool. What are your opinions on veganism within bushcraft? might be a good question for your Ask Paul Kirtley series. Well, indeed it is, and here is the question and the answer in Ask Paul Kirtley. What's my opinion on veganism within bushcraft, vegetarianism within bushcraft? I kind of think they're separate in, in the sense. Um, and, and what I mean by that is bushcraft, as I've said before, to me, is largely a study of nature. It's a practical study of nature. It's an understanding of the resources that are available to you, how to use them, how to harvest them, how to um, make sure they're there for you and others to use again in the future. Um, it's about being safe in the outdoors. It's about being comfortable in the outdoors or managing to come home safely and in one piece at least. Um, th those are all encompassed within, within bushcraft. Um, vegetarianism is a dietary choice to exclude certain things from your diet and, and we all do that, we all make choices about what we want to eat and what we don't want to eat in the most part and when I say we I mean the type of people who will tend to be watching this or people who can afford a phone or a computer or a screen where they can actually see this show. Um, you know, so it tends to be the, some of the wealthier people on the planet and most people who choose their diets rather than just have to accept what they can find tend to have more, more money. Um, and I'm talking on a global scale here. Um, you know, the people who are scrabbling a living poor on a global scale are not, they don't have the luxury of making those choices. And equally, people who are living off the land quite possibly don't have the luxury of making those choices. And living off the land in the past, in certain parts of the world, maybe where people are not living off the land anymore, certainly they wouldn't have had the luxury of being vegetarian or vegan, just because they needed to use certain resources and are unable to subsist. Um, my understanding is that it's easier to be a vegetarian living off the land, living from a lot of natural foods that just grow naturally without much farming. It's easier to be a vegetarian in tropical areas because there is a wider degree of plant foods that are available to you, wider degree of, of fruits and other sources of energy and nutrition in those more diverse habitats which you tend to find in the more tropical areas of the world. When you move further north, into say the boreal forest, um, there are fewer plant foods that you can subsist on, certainly there are fewer plant foods available in winter. Um, and equally if you think about where Inuit live, where they're hunting on the ice in the winter, there is no plant food there and they have to get their vitamins and nutrition entirely from animal food. Uh, some of which has to be in raw or had to be in raw in order to get the vitamins that they needed including vitamin C. So, Historically, 
if we're talking about historical context of bushcraft in that sense, there are certain places where you just could not have been a vegetarian and certainly not a vegan. Um, you couldn't be a vegan Inuit hunting on the ice, having to use skins um, for clothing, having to use uh, the meat for food. It just would not be possible. Um, but being in a tropical environment where you've got access to tropical fruits, you've got access to starches that are coming from trees to provide carbohydrates, etc., etc., um, and, and you know, thinking of sago and all that type of thing that you're getting, you could more easily live a vegetarian diet uh, and certainly a pescatarian diet in those in those places. Um, in the modern context, you know, you're asking the question via technology, you're asking, I'm answering it via technology, you've got the luxury of being able to make that choice and you're unlikely to be living off the land for an extended period of time. So within that context, if you're going out to do a trip for a weekend, a week, a couple of weeks, can you be a vegetarian and be practicing bushcraft skills in that context? Absolutely, of course you can. It's just a diet choice, just the same as you can choose to take entirely fresh food on a trip, or you can take entirely dehydrated food or packet food or you know, packets of pretzels, you know, you, you, you can choose what you want to take. So there is, so that's why I mean they're separate now. I think as a modern person, choosing to make a trip, a journey, a foray into the wilds where you're largely taking your own food, then you choose what you're going to subsist on. And then it's just a matter of making sure you've got enough calories to uh, get you where you need to go. Um, within within reasonable uh, uh, parameters of what you're trying to achieve and of course you can forage along the way and get more plant foods etc um, and most of that stuff's going to be foraging you know it, it's it's unlikely that say for example you're going to make a canoe trip and you're going to be hunting along the way for all of your food beca because you just don't have the time if you want to cover the distance yes you can fish in the evenings but most of the time you're going to be choosing to take most of your food with you even if you're practicing you know bushcraft fire lighting techniques or whatever it is you're choosing which techniques to apply you're choosing the menu that you want to take so though those decisions are independent largely and so I think I think they fit and then the other thing about veganism is it's not just about what you eat it's also about what you use and um, yes there's a lot of leather you know in bushcraft but again it's separate you know I always make this distinction between kit and bushcraft some pieces of kit make your bushcraft easier more efficient more refined and I'm thinking in particular of cutting tools um, they will make your bushcraft better more refined quicker more efficient um, whether or not your knife has a leather sheath or a black plastic sheath or a canvas sheath or it doesn't matter it, it, that, that's a, that's an equipment choice issue and then there are skills that go along with that and it's the skills and knowledge of nature and how to use it in a practical fashion which are uh, which is the bushcraft and then you've got the equipment so yes if you want to go out without wearing leather boots without a leather sheath without a leather belt or, or the other accoutrements that people often take with them um, in terms of equipment I can't see that there's any issue there and then it's interesting I've had people on courses who are um, Buddhist uh, vegan uh, who don't want to hunt they don't want to trap and yet they're still interested in learning the techniques because you never know um, and also they're just fascinated by everything in life and so they're interested in how to um, skin and butcher a rabbit it's already been shot they're not having to do it themselves themselves but they're not going to eat it but they're interested in how to do it they don't want the animal to be wasted and they're happy for somebody else to eat it they prepare it and i think that's quite a um open-minded and level-headed approach equally i've had big strapping blokes who can't do who are happy to eat meat who can't do the rabbit uh the small game preparation for example because their kids have rabbits and they just couldn't <laughs> couldn't face couldn't even though the rabbit was dead the game keeper had shot it um, they couldn't face skinning and, and gutting it and that's that's fine as well you have to respect that you're not going to you shouldn't be ridiculing or judging anybody for what they do and don't want to do within learning the subject most of us do not need to rely on these skills um, all the time certainly and even unless you're going into really wild places where there's a chance you might have to rely on them 
most of the time it's an interest, it's a hobby, um, it's something that augments your life, it gives you a greater appreciation of nature, it gives you a greater respect for nature and I think how you reconcile that with your other philosophies around respect for animals, respect for nature, it is absolutely fine. As long as you can make it work practically, um, I don't see the things being uh, mutually exclusive at all, frankly. be interesting to hear how you're getting on with all of that as well because that's that question from a little while ago cool that brings us to the end of this episode and thank you for your attention quite a diverse range of questions different subject matters there um, I've got some more questions lined up for episode 52 we've got the live um, episode coming up and um, so it'll be a few weeks before I can get any more uh, questions in that I haven't already got but please keep them coming please keep them coming because um, there's been a there's been some that are I, I've waited a little while to, to answer or I haven't got round to answering for a little while but I have noticed there's a bit of a tail off in the questions coming in that's probably a result of me not making so many shows in the first quarter of this year um, I had a lot of other things going on and it goes back to that conversation with Micah you know it's about what you can do on top of what you have to do to earn a living I don't earn a living directly from these shows um, but if there's a nice <laughs> if there's a nice company like uh, like here's my chance uh, somebody like uh, Fjall Raven or Tent TP or Mora or somebody like that that wants to sponsor this show then I would be happy to have a pre uh, pre-roll ad and a post-roll ad for the videos and for the podcast so if you work for one of those companies or grand Sports would be another good one you know these are the things these are the brands that i think are good anyway um, i use equipment from all of them and i would recommend wholeheartedly equipment from all of them and therefore they are the brands that i would want to be aligned with ones that i like anyway and going back to that question from for Micah that's the approach anybody should take because otherwise you're not being true to what you really believe so you might see some pre-roll or post-roll from some companies like that in the future but the only reason I would do that is so that I can make more of these shows to get more information out to you um, without having to go off and do something else to provide that same level of income but either way let me know what you think about all of that um, about this bushcraft scene and people the way different people earn money from it let me know in the comments below on my blog at paulcutley.co.uk episode 51 or under this on youtube so thanks for watching thanks for listening if you're on the podcast and i will see you on the next episode of ask paul Kirtley. and if you're coming to the bushcraft show make sure you come to the live ask paul Kirtley with your questions ready to go see you then